There seems to be a recurring issue here. Anger. I don't think I have an anger issue. I think you got an anger issue. Welcome to Now Playing Podcast Angry Birds Retrospective Series. We're going to need a bigger slingshot. Part of Now Playing's video game movie review series. Oh, it's on! Hosted by Arnie. I, uh, have been known to, uh, blow up. Justin. I see all and know all. And Stuart. Each of you has been selected because you're the best in your field. That we can find. This podcast may contain detailed plot spoilers and harsh language. Are you freaking kidding me? Listener discretion is advised. You tried to tell us, but we didn't listen. We hope you enjoy the show. And I'm just super psyched to be taking this journey with you. Ah, oh, you're gonna have a blast. Today we're discussing the Angry Birds movie. Starring Jason Sudeikis, Josh Gad. You okay there, Stuart? (laughs) Why? (laughs) I'm sorry, we aren't punking you. Like, we're really doing this. It's a real show. I sat, I watched it like one and a half times, took notes. (laughs) Josh Gad, Danny McBride, Maya Rudolph, Kate McKinnon. Sean Penn. Yes, the Sean Penn. I kind of love that, actually. <laughs> Tony Hale, Keegan Michael Key, with Bill Hader and Peter Dinklage, directed by Clay Gatiss and Fergal Riley. This is Arnie, co host of Now Playing, and I bring you greetings from my world, the world of the podcasters. Pluck my life, it's Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Justin. I'm just hoping to pass the level without dying. Well, you don't die in Angry Birds. That's the thing about this game. This game may be the most popular one we've discussed. It has over a billion downloads. And of course, I haven't played it. Like That was actually, <laughs> it became a point. I actually thought, wouldn't it be interesting to watch this movie not knowing the game and see if I could tell what the game was by what it was showing me. Let me take a guess at this. This is, again, never played. I might have played it once. I do remember I was at a Verizon store once, and while I was waiting to talk to a tech, I was fiddling around on a tablet and might have stumbled into the game. But my understanding of the game from watching this movie and watching some of the cartoon series, yes, I took that bullet, (laughs) was you can play one of five different colored birds... You're trying to steal pigs from taking eggs from your nest, and you have trampolines and plungers and slingshots. Uh, That might be a little bit more of a complicated version of what actually the game is. It's basically you just sling a bird at a structure and try to pop all the pigs with as few shots as possible, and there's different obstacles and stuff like that. Do you not destroy buildings? I seem to remember in the thing that I played, there was a sort of glee in being able to take down whole structures. That's exactly it. You're trying to destroy the pig structures, and in the doing so, you're popping these pigs. Some pigs are harder to pop. You need a stone or a rock thing to fall on their head and pop them just right. Sometimes you need to hit things that blow up the TNT boxes that help blow up the bigger pigs. Oh. But yeah, it's it's pretty simple concept. And what's crazy is... This is the first video game that we're talking about that is solely on touchscreens and mobile devices. It did come out eventually for platforms. Right, but I'm saying this is the first one that started its life in the touchscreen era. Yeah, I looked this up. We can blame Finland, right? Like Rovio, they had made apparently 51 different mobile phone titles, including a Need for Speed sequel. For your phone, before they hit pay dirt, basically a decade ago, December 2009, they finally land on this concept, and it totally changes the playing field for them. They Within three years, a billion downloads. That's astronomical. I assume you guys were among the billion. Well, I was working in the app industry at this time. I still work for the same company, but we were more heavily into apps at the time. And the story around the water cooler was that this game was something that they just kind of did in their free time over a couple weeks while they were working on their big idea. Mm -hmm. And I went back to try to verify that story, and they've kind of whitewashed the history of this. They're acting like, you know, oh, we always had plans. We went back and forth. We were testing all the engines and all this stuff. It's like, uh, the story for about two and a half years there was that you guys just kind of back-ended into this over 
a weekend and didn't know what you had. That seems to be the story with all <laughs> the casual games like Candy Crush and Angry Birds and these simple little concepts. The simpler, the better, because most of the games we've reviewed movies based on so far are gamer games, right? You have to own a console. Mm -hmm. But where you, the real money is in today's gaming is the casual game market, the housewives, the older professionals and only want to play a game on the toilet for a little while, you know? That's a multi-billion dollar industry. You know what? That's where I drew the line. I've never played any, I've never played Farmville, Candy Crush. I told myself I have a addictive personality when it comes to video games. If I download a game on my phone, I'm not going to get anything done. So I just, I've never downloaded a single game to my phone. And I was an early adopter of Angry Birds. It was December 2009. And I had, again, I think I've talked about him on the show before, the world's best manager. But he was an early adopter of all things. I did talk about him. He was the one who was playing the pre-Pokemon game where you had to assault the towers. And he also was playing Angry Birds. And it was around Christmas. And I'm like, yeah, I read something about it. I'm not at all interested. And he loaded it up like he projected his phone onto the screen, very Tony Stark-like, and was playing Angry Birds. And I'm like, all right, now I got to download this game. And it was free to play the first few levels. That's how they get you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought it was a free game. It was free for the first few levels. And then once you've beat those levels and you want more levels, then you give them money. Mm -hmm. And I was really addicted to this. I think the best way to describe this, though, is it's a puzzle game. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain strategies that have to be done, and it's all using physics. It's kind of like a game of pool. You pull back the slingshot, and you fire the birds, and all the birds have different powers. You got a boomerang bird that we see here. You got the fast bird that can break through more stuff. Okay, so you can manipulate all those birds. You don't pick one bird to be and play the game. No, in fact, it tells you, here are the birds you have for this level. Figure out how to pop the pigs in as few steps as possible. And you can get up to three stars. There's a joke in this movie, on a scale of one to three, how good was my service? It's because if you do it best as possible, it'll tell you at the end you get three stars. Sometimes you get two. I'm happy if I just pass the level and get onto the next one and get a single star. But obsessives will go back and try again and again mm. until they get three stars and figure out... Where is the weak spot structurally? It's almost like reverse Jenga. Instead of like pulling out the bricks and hoping the structure doesn't fall, you're hurling things at the structure and hoping it does fall. Mm -hmm. I, you know what? It sounds like a game I would enjoy. I mean, as someone that really likes, you know, I know it's not totally comparable, but like a Tetris or something like that, where you really are thinking about the pattern of something. Yeah, I would totally get into this game. It's that, but there's also, you have to figure out the arc, and you have to figure out how far back to pull the slingshot so you have the right amount of force. So there's that skill involved as well as the analytical. Right. This game came out at the right time for the touch devices, because up until this point, there might have been some other games, but none this successful, to use the physics engine built into these devices. It wasn't just pull it back and aim a little bit. Like Arnie's saying, there was degrees of how far to pull back and make sure you're going only so far this time now that you've tried it once or twice. And there's levels where you're not even trying to hit the building. You're trying to hit something over the building that triggers a series of events that knocks rocks down a hill, that blows up a thing, that then sends a board flying across the screen, that then knocks over the structure from the backside. But I don't think you can play the original game anymore. They kept updating it, and it became something more asset managing after a while but you're still shooting birds and whatnot but i don't think you can go back and play the original levels anywhere it is not for the iphone i did find it on the pc and i bet it's still available for consoles they put it out on disc you know where you just had to use the analog sticks to pull things back and figure out your degrees and i did play it i think on the ps3 or ps2 so that would be the best way to get it. But I did find it in a browser where you just use the mouse and I was able to replay some of that old stuff. Let me tell you how successful this was. In 2011 or 2012, Rovio entered into a partnership with Hasbro where there would be Angry Birds toys. So you'd actually get like a Jenga set and you'd actually fling these little bird toys trying to knock down the structures. Very fun for kids. Mm -hmm. But there was a time in 2013 where I kid you not, Hasbro and Lucasfilm thought Angry Birds would, and I quote, save Star Wars. 
<laughs> there was Star Wars Angry Birds. I mean, they started with Angry Birds in space. Once the game was a hit, you had all these different things in space would change your physics entirely. Well, they ended up doing Star Wars Angry Birds. We had, instead of the yellow bird, a Luke Skywalker bird. And instead of a bomb bird, a Chewbacca bird. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are no birds in Star Wars other than the Millennium Falcon. What's the tie? They're the birds in Star Wars costumes, and the pigs are all wearing Stormtrooper helmets, but there's still pigs under there. And Vader was like a Darth Vader pig. So it was a weird crossover with the characters. Yeah, that seems really tenuous. Like, I know they also did a version based on a Fox animated movie called Rio, which at least was about birds. They just took the birds from Rio and put them in a game. But you're saying that now they just poured anything. I think Transformers, there's been several different, basically, skins that they're putting on these birds to make it fresh and new when they don't have to work that hard at making a new game. <laughs> Arnie, it's funny you bring that up. I forgot about the actual physical board game that they came out with before the whole Star Wars craze. And I think I bought some of those sets because as a kid, I used to play, you remember Crossbows and Catapults? Uh-huh. Yeah, I used to love that game and I thought this might be a new modern version of it and it really wasn't. Like, it was just throwing a ball and a, <laughs> a thing that you had to go set up physically, but... Yeah, I forgot about, like, yeah, they went to toys, and then they went to Star Wars, and like Stuart said, Transformers. They were all over the place from 2010 to 2016. And why would Star Wars need this kind of saving? Well, it was eight years after Revenge of the Sith. Mm. There was no sale to Disney. Toy sales had plummeted. They were trying various things to appeal to new markets. What do the kids like? Apps! Let's do Angry Birds Star Wars, and Rovio will put out a game, and we'll put out the toys. And I was covering Star Wars then, and I had an overly frank discussion with the brand manager at that time. Mm -hmm. I had a cold, I had cold medicine, and then Marjorie decided the best thing to do was to give me alcohol to, like, wash away the germs. And so cold medicine plus alcohol plus me at a Hasbro event talking to the brand manager going, No one wants Angry Birds! <laughs> we want figures! And what are you going to figure? Fix the figure. What's wrong with the figure? What's right with the figure? That is a literal quote from me to the Hasbro brand manager that evening. <laughs> to be fair, how successful was Angry Birds Star Wars? Did they do more of them? No, no, no. I think the game was spectacularly successful. I picked up the games all on clearance at a Ross mm -hmm. <laughs> because they did not sell. I went to Pluckin' Germany and <laughs> sat through a Hasbro presentation waiting for them to announce figures, and all they talked about was Angry Birds for a half an hour. I was livid! <laughs> and that's when I got off the Angry Birds train. I had played the Star Wars one to completion, and I'm like, pluck those birds. But at the same time, this is where the whole franchise really gets into gear, because Rovio creates a Toon TV platform, a web-based place where you can go and watch cartoons. Guess what for? Angry Birds tunes. For three years, they put out these little bits. They don't last more than five minutes. They call them episodes now. They've been repackaged onto Netflix. But they kind of did what I was asking them to do with Pokemon. They emulated the old Tex Avery, Warner Brothers, Looney Tunes style. In part because they knew language was a problem. This is a finished property. It's going to have an international appeal. So let's not have the birds do any talking. There is no English that is being spoken. It is all sound effects. And it is a lot of physical comedy. That will remind you, maybe not in its best version, but it will remind you of Bugs and Elmer and those characters. And that seemed to be the groundwork for where they built the idea for this movie. Was that a cell-drawn animated series, or was it more of the 3D models like we see in the movie? Actually, when you watch the movie... Fred has a fantasy about Mighty Eagle in which he's flexing his muscles and doing all this. And it's a di you'll notice it is a cell drawn different style. That is how the entire series looked. Ah, interesting. And it was hu huge. It, five billion times viewed. So again, if I thought there was no need for an Angry Birds movie, this would be proving me wrong. Wow, I had no idea that Angry Birds had such life after I flushed it down the black hole. I thought when this movie came out, to me, it felt like Angry Birds was a moment in the zeitgeist, and that moment had passed. And I do think for mass consciousness, it has. It is no longer the number one game, though it still has a lot of players, of course. But when this came out, and not long after, when the Emoji movie came out, I sitting in theaters, I think watching Big Hero 6 or one of those movies we reviewed, and I'm just sitting there like that meme. 
Why, though? <laughs> yeah, you can say that, and I felt that way, too. But you do know this movie made $108 million in the U.S. and 350 worldwide. It wasn't just a hit. It was an enormous hit. It was a hit that's going to earn it a sequel so that we got to talk about this game and these movies twice. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show how immensely popular this game got. I mean... For it to, like, fall off of our radars, Arnie, we've kind of ignored it, we've moved past it, but with 1.7 billion people having downloaded it, they can cut that number in half, they can cut it in half again and cut it in half again, and that's still millions of people paying attention actively to this property. Yeah, so two Chinas have downloaded this game. Exactly. And I have to think that for a, a certain generation, the generation that, like, we grew up on coin-op games, they grew up on cell phone games, these are always going to be characters that mean something to them. These are their Mario. These are their Pikachu. I mean, keep in mind, I said it when we covered Pokemon, Pikachu was the first video game character to get a Macy's Parade float. The second one were these angry birds. And you can still see them going down Manhattan streets every Thanksgiving. What the fuck? <laughs> That may be the case for some people, and that may be what they're banking on, but I can tell you firsthand experience. I have a 14-year-old daughter. She grew up with Angry Birds. When this game came out, she was five, able to understand it and play it, played it a lot, understood the characters. She could give a fly and feather about this property now. Yeah. Like, she doesn't want to see the movies. She doesn't care about any updates to the apps. None of it. I'm going to predict that we are setting ourselves up to cover the flop of the summer. No one will be in that theater. I'm going to be so embarrassed. I actually may lie and tell the ticket person I'm buying a ticket for something else, anything else. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. The motivational Christian movie of the week. It, it, who cares? Just don't make me think I'm going to see Angry Birds 2 because nobody ever would go see that movie in theaters. But we are. We are in about three weeks. We have to delay because of movies that people want to hear us talk about coming out in the next couple of weeks. Well, I did not know about the Netflix series. The only thing I knew about that same manager, a couple of years later, we were still playing Angry Birds and comparing level strategies. And he showed me a YouTube video and I shared it with you guys. To me, it's the only Angry Birds I ever need. It's the Angry Birds and the Pigs go to arbitration. <laughs> <laughs> Done by Jim Henson's second cousin, I believe. <laughs> First of all, it is emulating the music and the sound effects of the game so well, and yet the birds are almost cursing. Instead of wah wah, you get what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Careful there, you might get a PG-13. <laughs> you can search for Angry Birds Meeting. I will post this on Facebook and Twitter. If you've ever liked Angry Birds, this is the three-minute short to watch. Yes, it's skewing to more adult, teenage, sarcastic humor. It's pretty clear once we get into this movie that they're aiming for those tots. This is rated PG. I do not know why. It says rude humor and action. I guess action is just something you don't want in a G-rated movie. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, if anything was made for children that we've ever covered, this is a G movie through and through. Yeah, I think there's a couple poop jokes or something, but I was shocked when I put this in and it wasn't G rated. Just animated, looked like it was aimed at kids. But I'll be honest, the PG rating gave me a little bit of hope because Shrek is PG rated. I would recommend the first Shrek as memory serves. I haven't seen it in 17 years, mm -hmm. but... I like Shrek. You know, I have a reputation on this show for being an animation hater. That is not the case. I did go through our entire archives to see how many animated films I've recommended versus not. Unfortunately, the Pokemon helped balance those scales a little more than I would have liked. Mm. But if you take Pokemon out of it, it's a two to one recommend to not ratio. Mm -hmm. And so I'm coming in thinking if this is going to be PG and I knew from the soundtrack it's going to have some modern music on it. Well, not necessarily people that I love, but yeah, Demi Lovato was going to cover I Will Survive. Yeah, and Limp Bizkit was pulled out of mothballs for some <laughs> reason. But I'm like, maybe this is going to be Angry Birds Shrek version and I could get into this movie. I was highly optimistic pushing play. Now, you always have that condition, I'll call it. You, you always want to believe the best is possible, and good on you for trying. I did not have optimism going into this, but I do agree there has been many times when I've watched an animated film and found there are layers for the adult. 
There are things that adults can laugh about, or even in the best of them, Pixar, themes, Toy Story movies are all about middle age. You're not even going to totally understand them until you're an adult. So I definitely feel like animated movies are like any other. They can be as good or as bad as anything else. And because it's animated and because it's based on a video game, doesn't necessarily mean that my arrow is red as we hit play. But, well, why don't we get into the movie? Well, the movie takes place primarily on an island populated by birds who cannot fly. The star of this movie is a red bird named, simply, Red, voiced by Jason Sudeikis. Red has an anger management issue, and after several incidents with other island birds, the island's judicator, Judge Peckinpah, orders Red to anger management class led by Matilda, voiced by Maya Rudolph. In class, Red meets a few other island misfits. Speedster Yellowbird Chuck, voiced by Josh Gad. Angry giant Redbird Terrence, who speaks only in grunts uttered by Sean Penn. And Danny McBride plays Blackbird Bomb, who, when angered, actually explodes like his namesake. The island's tranquility is broken when a boat arrives crewed by green pigs, led by King Leonard Mudbeard, voiced by Bill Hader. The pigs bring gifts heretofore unknown to the birds, like a trampoline and a slingshot. The island birds welcome the pigs with open wings, but Red is suspicious of the pigs' arrival and motives. With the help of Chuck and Bomb, Red investigates and discovers the pigs are there to steal all the birds' eggs containing the unborn bird children. Judge Peckinpah, voiced by Keegan-Michael Key, and the other island birds don't believe Red until the pigs set sail with all the bird eggs. Red and his friends sought help from the famed protector of the island, the only bird who can fly, the Mighty Eagle voiced by Peter Dinklage. But the eagle has not flown in years and is self-absorbed, so he does not assist. So Red takes up the position of leader and leads the birds to Piggy Island, where, using the pig's own tools of trampolines and slingshots, the birds literally launch an assault on the pigs before they can eat all the bird eggs. Red, Chuck, and Bomb infiltrate the king's castle and find the eggs, and Mighty Eagle arrives at the last moment to help fly the eggs to safety. Red and King Mudbeard face off over the final egg, but the king is defeated when he accidentally sets off all the pig's dynamite, while Red hides safely from the blast. The birds return home with their eggs, and Red is now an esteemed member of society, and he's no longer a loner. He's friends with Chuck and Bomb, as we see King Mudbeard devising a new plan to get the eggs, and credits roll. Okay, I'm the lucky one. You guys went to Comic-Con, both of you, and while you were away doing all of that, I said, oh, I'll take the hit and I'll watch all the extras because you guys aren't going to have time when you come back. You guys are going to know all the extra features on the DVD Blu-ray. I got to say, they're filled with great bits of information, like a woman dressed as a chicken teaching you the dance move. <laughs> I expect you to show me those dance moves before you leave tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why not? But among the few kernels of information that were actually useful, the filmmakers did state what they wanted this movie to be was an origin story for what made the birds in the video game angry. I ask you, is that what we get here? We're going to start on a bird island where every bird is apparently happy except one. And we have this one bird named Red who has a really temperamental disposition and he will be proved correct in his anger as the movie proceeds. But when we start, this bird is running through the jungle. It's voiced by Jason Sudeikis, an actor that came up when we were discussing Dead Poet Society because he played the Robin Williams role on the stage version. I've never seen his work. Is he known for being angry? Is this a thing for him? Not really. More than anything, I think of him as blasé. I mean, if you watch We're the Millers, a lot of stuff just rolls off his back. And I've watched every episode of Saturday Night Live he's been on. And he can be angry, but it's not his shtick. Yeah, anger's not his thing. Like Arnie said, blasé, sardonic maybe. But it's not reading from the very beginning. If what they're saying on that extra is that this whole movie's going to hinge on one angry bird teaching the rest of them why anger is good... It falls apart right away because Jason Sudeikis does not deliver that angry character from frame one. 
Yeah, he's on the bonus materials, and I got to say, he either had pink eye or he was stoned. <laughs> I mean, they are just watery and red, and he is not doing anger. He's not, he seems, yeah, very affable. And so he's a weird choice. When I think about Inside Out, if you guys saw the Pixar movie, they got Louis Black to embody anger. Perfect. Because mm-hmm. that guy is just neurotic and always shouting. That's his shtick. You know, Sam Kinison, if he was still alive. There's certain comedians that you would go to that said, yes, that's... That is unmitigated anger. Because Sudeikis is playing it the way it is, is his anger unjustified or does he have a reason to be mad? Because as we go through this movie, first of all, I'm just really weirded out about the fact that he's running. He's running, he's swinging on vines, and it is said that birds don't fly. Is that why they're angry? They want to fly and they can't fly because, you know, short of dodos and emus, I've never heard of birds that don't fly. (laughs) Is that why you hate the emus? Because they run? (laughs) They're very fast and they're bigger. And I just saw a video one time of a woman being pecked by one very violently. And it's, yeah, just they're gross. Why would you like an emu? (laughs) Well, Stuart, you're starting to pick out points in this movie real early that I think I'm going to have a major overall problem with. And in that the movie's trying to answer questions about the game that I don't think anybody had. I don't think anybody's thinking while they're playing Angry Birds, well, why don't these birds just fly? It's like, because the guys who made it made it a slingshot game. Who cares if they don't fly? Yeah, why do they make it birds, I suppose, is the real question. Is Why is it birds that can't fly that need a slingshot? <laughs> I, that's exactly right. I'm like, if they made a video game about fish and they don't swim, I would be irate. I would want my quarterback. I'm like, no, this doesn't make sense. So again, that must be the thrust of why he's angry, right? Like, he's this little guy running on land and he can't fly. But we're going to find out every bird on this island actually can't fly. What is he running to? Okay, then it gets weirder. (laughs) All right, so if we're going to establish that he's angry, that he's moved his house away from all the other birds that live in the same village, why would you choose to be a clown? And a clown that is delivering cakes to children, if you don't like people, seems like a very bad career path. We're told that he's bringing this egg, it's actually just an egg-shaped container for a cake, to a hatch day party. He arrives on this patio, and I see an egg, I'm thinking, well, that egg is going to hatch. No, there's some other kid. It's a birthday party, basically, for some kid, and the egg is the stinger for this scene. All right, here's what I was reading into this. Obviously, he's not a people bird. He doesn't have a lot of friends. And let's face it, very few people ever want to be a clown. It's something that you kind of have to do. I don't understand at all. I mean, now I'm getting crazy on myself. I don't know the bird economy. I don't know what the birds use for money. I don't know if he needs to have a job. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what? Yeah. Do we need money if we're birds and we can just get some seed or something from somewhere? All of these are questions that if you're making Angry Birds movie, you know, the writer's room, they had to ask these things. But I'm someone that has never known the world from the video game. I want to understand. I'm already weirded out that he has no ability to fly. And then, yeah, he hates people but he's going to try to entertain children as a clown. And then they make it that it's his fault that he's late. Even though he arrives there at 11.59, he was told to get there before noon. Not late, right? I thought he was delivering a pizza in that egg. When they made the joke, it should have been a pizza. It would have made way more sense. Yeah, so I'm on his side when the dad's like, this is on you, you're late. I'm like, if you wanted me to be here at 11, then you tell me to be here at 11 plus if the child cries when it sees a clown maybe you should be glad i showed up late and didn't ruin (laughs) the party i mean all of this is just kind of crazy but it's all just done so fast it's meant to emulate the kinds of openings we do see in animated movies where we get excited and it's a sense of fun and they can make the computer graphics fly at your face really fast i was thinking of scrat from ice age Yeah, there's a squirrel in the cake. For comic reasons, there's a squirrel, and he ends up tripping on it. And then things get super weird, because he falls on the egg that's on the porch, and immediately I think he just killed a hatchling. (laughs) This is really dark. (laughs) Right. Let's start off with a little infanticide at the beginning of this kid's movie. 
<laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, but is it really his fault? Because like, if I left a baby on a porch and something bad befell it, that's on me, right? Like that is a crime that I will be prosecuted against. Where are the parents? Why are they not sitting on this egg if it hasn't hatched? All of this. What I'm really saying here <laughs> is I don't understand a friggin' thing that I'm seeing in this first five minutes. Okay. I said I was optimistic. Part of the reason I was optimistic was... Jason Sudeikis. I enjoy this performer. And we're also going to be talking about Bill Hader. Those two worked off each other so well on Saturday Night Live. It's unbelievable. If You gotta watch their sports announcer sketches. I'm sure they're on Hulu somewhere because NBC Hulu has this thing. They're not on YouTube. Oh yeah, Sudeikis is one of my favorite working comedic actors today. So I too had some high hopes coming into this. Like, all right, this movie might suck, but at least we're going to get some good Jason Sudeikis stuff out of this. Yeah, and this opening, yeah, it didn't make a lot of sense. I'm not going to hold the parents accountable for putting the bird out because I don't know the social norms and mores of bird world. But you get my point. Why was the egg just sitting out there? Maybe it needs warmth to hatch. Yes, created by the bird sitting on the egg. Well, those are flying birds. I don't know anything about this bird. <laughs> You're right. These are birds that don't fly. We don't know a thing about these birds. What I can say about this opening is it gives us a very honest assessment of what we're about to get into. <laughs> it's going to be a muddled mess of things where <laughs> you're just going to have questions of why that aren't important to what's actually happening on the screen. So it becomes apparent that this is something that at the beginning you would think is aimed at a G-rated audience that... Somebody somewhere along the way said, hey, let's slap some adult humor in in the background every once in a while. See, my problem is he's not angry enough. You were mentioning some of the voice actors. I think of Dennis Leary in his best days as somebody who could really bring that anger and just the petulance and the spite. And here... This bird seems to be a victim of circumstance, and he's snarky bird is what he is. He's not really angry bird. He's just kind of pissy bird. He's realist the bird. I'm actually going to argue when we meet all the other birds, most of them are not angry. This is just a misnomer in and of itself. But anyway, I'm going to take this scene as, okay, he screwed up. I think they're telling us that he screwed up. He should have been on time or earlier or not running and gotten a squirrel in the cake. He certainly shouldn't have fallen on the egg. And we should just immediately go to the judge and see him prosecuting on this case. But then they're like, no, time for credits. And we get paranoid by Sabbath. Is the bird paranoid? I didn't. I don't understand that. Maybe it's cheap. I know maybe Ozzy <laughs> likes playing Angry Birds and they set him up for life on his phone. I can't imagine why. But we get a montage of all the things in Red's life that might have made him angry. And some of them seem legit. Like there's kids in art class that seem to be mocking him at an early age for having big eyebrows. And then he goes to a movie and somebody is always sneezing on his popcorn. That would piss me off. There's one little bird that's constantly kicking a soccer ball against his wall while he's trying to sleep. I get that he's angry. But when they finally get to the last scene in the montage, it goes by so quick, but it's actually the root of all of it. There's an egg sitting in the lost and found and a red fist punches out. That's him being born, right? Yeah. He does not have parents. Later, someone says, you don't have parents. I don't know how an egg can exist without parents, but that's really the root of this story gets completely overshadowed. This is a bird that grew up without a mother or a father. Yeah, he's just picked on his whole life. He's a born loser. We see some female birds. He thinks they're waving at him. They're waving at the bird behind him. And yeah, he was angry from birth because his parents left the egg in the lost and found instead of hatching it like good bird parents would. So that's the plot of the movie, right? Finding the biological parents, getting to the root of all that. Like, that's huge. That is a story <laughs> that you tell, right? Nope. Has no bearing on anything in this movie. Well, that's because his parents can't be pigs, and this is Angry Birds, especially if it's an origin story. <laughs> some birds have got to fling at some pigs. <laughs> I got a real easy one. Like, can we just make it this? Because this would make really a lot of sense to me and where they're going and what I think they're trying to do here. He's on an island where all the birds can fly but him. And he's the only bird that can't. And he's angry about that. And he's going to learn over the course of this movie through using slingshots and trampolines that he can get airborne and save them from the pigs and do everything that they do that makes them feel superior. I see where you're going with that, but... 
It breaks the fundamental rule of the game. It does, but so does the whole giant eagle thing, too. No, so. there is actually an eagle in the game that will come and drop stuff. Right. In the game, the eagle's actually majestic. Let's hold on that eagle. That's <laughs> another whole rant I got. But yeah, okay. Maybe they should have you voice Red, Stuart. I think <laughs> I honestly think, all right, Jason Sudeikis, I'm a fan of him, but let's have him sit out Angry Birds 2 if it's not too late. Get you in the sound booth. You can record it right here, <laughs> and you can just voice the whole damn thing. I got, yeah, believe me, I got hours on this. I mean, just on this first five minutes, because again, I don't know the games. I don't know these characters. I watched a few of the wordless cartoon slapstick things on the web, but I'm waiting to see a movie. We're here for the Angry Birds movie, and this is a total head screw here that I never get over. I never understand why we started this way or why it's about this bird that... The only thing that matters is he's convicted and he's meant to go serve an anger management class. Let me ask you something. I read a little bit up on this, but I didn't do all the bonus features you did. There's a ton of deleted material on this. There's actors who were completely excised from it. Did you watch the deleted scenes? And if so, does any of this maybe bear fruit in those? There's nothing in the deleted scenes that adds context to meaning or character. There are more bits. If there was actors that aren't featured in the movie, I didn't notice that. There are just moments that go on longer. Huh. Because my question was going to be, did they originally shoot this with Larry David playing Red? Which would make much more sense as his character would have been just perfect for what they're trying to portray here. Yeah. Or get Jason Alexander, the fake Larry David, either way. Right. Yeah, why didn't they give this movie to us? Like, we're here spitballing a better movie <laughs> than, than what was thrown. I guess they got the actors that they could, probably actors that had recently had children and thus felt the need to make something for small children. But yeah, this is highly unsatisfying. My reference point. The only thing that I could, in looking at this story and seeing what does it remind me of that is beloved, was the Grinch. When you think about the Grinch, he lived all alone, he resented Whoville, and secretly, he wanted to connect with them, and the story would be about how he stopped being angry and opened his heart and learned how to be a part of the community. And that's kind of what they're going to do here with Red. If you're going to be the Angry Bird co-host, I'm going to take the role of Happy Bird co-host then and say... The animation in this is amazing, though, and it was advertised as Angry Birds 3D, and we gotta think, just three short years ago, 3D was still viable in the States. Now it seems to be mostly an international thing. I have to say, even though in the game the birds didn't have feet and the birds didn't have wings, here... The way that they move, the beak, I was actually really impressed with the beak. No beak would ever move like this because beaks are like fingernails. <laughs> if you recommend this movie over a beak, I'm going to throttle you. <laughs> I'm just saying I like the animation style here. I like his big eyebrows. You know, I was trying to think, why didn't they get Eugene Levy? I mean, he's got the eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. There are so many good voice actor choices that I would know. I, again, I don't know this actor. He's not selling me on the anger. If anything, I feel like this community is very hard on him. When the judge is just like, we're all glad you moved away and we don't like you. And the stenographer, is, it's a woodpecker and he pecks on a block of wood and he shows that Red is angrier yelling at people than he is. This is someone that has been bullied. He is angry because life has dealt him a bad hand of cards. He doesn't have pain. Parents and the people that he's with are so impossibly rude that he's had to move his nest to the beach. It's also a little bit that for whatever reason they feel handcuffed by using Red as the main character here because the Red Bird was the one front and center in the logo. Yes. When I think about toys or Mylar balloons I've seen at grocery stores, it's always the Red Bird. I think that is what you will see in the Macy's Day Parade. Like that is the bird. If you cover an angry bird, you're thinking about Red. Yeah, but just because it's red doesn't mean he has to be bland. But I mean, I think that's just a coincidence. Like, I'm not sure that they ever set out to make the red bird the mascot. I think it's the one they probably picked as they were throwing that logo together because it looked good. It was also the first one. I mean, you start with the red bird, and on the early levels, you only get the red bird. And as you progress further, then you get the yellow bird and the boomerang pelican and all that. Right, but with the story that they're laying out here about a bird that is the angry one and trying to control his anger, it would make more sense that Bomb be that character that we're following who's trying to control his anger so he doesn't always blow up in every situation and learn how to control that explosive anger. But he's just kind of a side character. 
and, and is Bob angry? Again, when we finally get to the anger management class, I don't know that any of the birds are angry. Bob is volatile. Bomb, if he is surprised or frightened, will explode. The case they give us is he comes home, they throw a surprise party for him, jump out of the dark, and he just in shock. I mean, he, he calls it going boom, boom, which is a euphemism for pooping yourself. I mean, that's he kind of you know does one in his pants. That's the way I see it. He just can't control his reactivity. Yeah, I didn't see it as pooping himself but i i saw it as almost a euphemism for flatulence like yeah whenever he'd get startled he'd fart and that would create the explosion even though there is a wick on his head but all right i'll admit at the beginning here i'm just scratching my head i'm keeping up with who the voices are i'm seeing key as the judge and all of that and i'm like okay anger management class this is a great storytelling engine i think about the tv show dear john or the sitcom starve there are a lot of shows and movies that take place around group therapy sessions where you can bring together disparate people with a similar problem and i'm like okay now the movie's going to get good because we're not just going to have this little pissy bird we're going to have a crew of mad birds but They're not really all that mad either. The yellow bird is more hyperactive than mad. Yes, Chuck is not mad. I mean, I guess he has a bit of a temper because the story they tell is he gets a speeding ticket. And he's mad enough that while that cop is still riding the ticket, he flies over. Because he's so fast, the cop doesn't even notice that he goes to the station and, like, wipes his butt on the cop's desk. And then he pickpockets his wallet and uses it to buy a vanilla ice cream cone and then drips that on top of him. Or maybe that's bird poop. They waffle on that. He is a little bit destructive. But by and large, he's just hyper. I assume this is what the character in the video game is. It's a fast-moving bird. Yeah, it's it's the speed that because it has more inertia can break through more walls than red i'm like you arnie i like the idea anger management feels like a very adult concept i'm not sure if kids they might know what a timeout is but young children aren't probably going to know what anger management is this is an opportunity to do some outreach to me and adults in the audience and yeah talk about things that in our society, make us angry and introduce some characters that share that anger. The only one that seems to be truly angry like Red is also Red. It is Terrence, and it is played by Sean Penn, who they just get to grunt. They showed him in the booth. He will never utter a word. He is just there to do different versions of grunting. This is, I think, something that has become a little bit of a tradition started by George Clooney. Because George Clooney, if you maybe remember, was a huge fan of South Park. That Spirit of Christmas video that went around. Yes. He was one of the celebrities that really got it seen. And when South Park became a TV show on Comedy Central, they got George Clooney to play a gay dog named Sparky. Mm -hmm. Now, Sparky doesn't talk. He just, and arf. And that is George Clooney. Okay. (laughs) And so I feel like they're kind of doing that here with Sean Penn. Although, from what I know of Sean Penn, he's a little haughty. I can't imagine what would convince him to get in the booth, even to just go, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Sean Penn has a good sense of humor about himself. He's done some rules where it's really soul bearing. We forget about early Sean Penn. Sean Penn started as a comedian, a doofus. Spicoli. And then in order to prove himself, because when you get typecast in such a thing and you want to be a serious dramatic actor, he just went so far in the other way with the drinking and the violence and and all of that, that yes, uh, you can forget about the early days. This is sort of reclaiming that sense of fun. And he was smiling in the booth. He did seem to be enjoying the acting challenge of being able to do voice acting without words. And he will have the romance, too, of this story. He will be romancing Matilda, the female character here, the new age chicken, the free rage chicken. Are you laughing yet? That's running this ashram is voiced by Maya Rudolph. And she and Terrence will ultimately, over striking up poses and paintings and doing all of this laughable new age anger management therapy, they will fall in love. This is a little bit of my issue is I'm an adult watching a kid's film. The jokes aren't hitting with me, but 
I really don't think yoga is a solution to rageaholics. But that would be the root, right? Like, that's why so many people scoff at the field of psychiatry and psychology is that they think all of that stuff is BS and that that's not the way to deal with your anger. And none of the adult humor in the background is landing with you? Like, you didn't find it hilarious that there was a sculpture of a bird orgy happening that he felt the need to point out to the audience of kids watching this there are jokes in this movie that will make me laugh and they're all background jokes they're all just little things in the background that i think that's clever i wish the dialogue was okay so like you're saying literally things drawn in the background don't pay attention to the story pay attention to what the background animators are doing Mm mm-hmm Okay. Yeah, I didn't maybe do that enough. I did see that orgy sculpture, but it went by so fast, I wasn't sure of what I saw. I mean, I like the joke when the mama bird is giving the baby birds lunch in the brown sacks, and she's regurgitating into the sacks instead of directly into the bird's mouth. This kind of stuff. I mean, it's a lot of bird jokes. I mean, you like Howard the Duck. I was thinking Howard the Duck. There is a (laughs) feather load of puns in this, and it never reaches the heights of Howard the Duck. Mm. But we are dealing with two puntastic movies about birds that can't flock. And just to throw into that theme, I remember when When I was a kid, I had a Pac-Man joke book, and this was reminding me of that. Like, in my mind, I'm always thinking, who would want to hear all these jokes about these angry birds? But when I was the right age, yes, it was just hysterical to hear Pac-Man puns. And so I think there is an audience being served here. And I do think you're right. The animation is good enough for the movies that I think that there are we ones that are not going to be having any of these problems. I'm not reviewing it for them. I'm reviewing it as an adult that would be taking my kids to this film. And I'm trying to figure out, though, the casting. Because you mentioned Maya Rudolph. We're just dealing with the entire 2000s decade SNL cast here. I'm like, why do you have so many SNL people? Who is that trying to appeal to? I know they all have their own cachet in films. Maya Rudolph was in Bridesmaids. They'll make a joke about Bridesmaids in here. I mean, that's how witty they are. I think they're hoping that these people can ad-lib, that they can get in the booth and make the material they're being given, which everyone must assume is not very good, polished. I mean, that can happen. I mean, don't tell me Eddie Murphy didn't make Donkey better just by coming up with stuff. And Robin Williams, of course, is the genie, maybe the epitome of that. Were they in the booth together? Because I know that's one of the big problems with the animation is most of the time it's one person alone. Yes. And you can't riff on that. And we talked about with Toy Story 4, they got Key and Peel in the booth together so that they could just ad lib and build on top of each other and do all kinds of wacky stuff. If you're going to get these three together and Bill Hader and Jason Sudeikis have very few scenes together, but if they were going to try to get some of this ad lib improv comedy out of them were they recording simultaneously no and again you might even want them to work on the script too you might want to just fire all the writers and just say go to town help us out here these are professional people that are known to come up with a lot of stuff on a weekly basis they're thrown into situations that they have to make work comedically and the reason why you get all these people is they're going to bring the funny And so if we're not laughing, then it is the fault really of this movie because they have the talent. Yeah. And see, while this is all going on on screen and I'm not getting any of that out of these characters, I'm telling myself a different story in my head. I'm talking about how these guys all must have the same agent who made a series of phone calls over the course of a week saying, hey, Bill, Jason's on board for this. Why don't you come in? And then he calls Jason. Hey, Jason, Bill's on board for this. Why don't you come on in? <laughs> like you said, it's, it's it's a complete missed opportunity to flesh out some of these other characters and the script a little bit. I mean, in a movie that's filled with just crappy puns, instead of sending birds to, let's say, the birdcage for punishment... Like, maybe this is a diversionary tactic, is he gets to go to anger management and that doesn't work out, and jail is still hanging over his head. None of that. It's just, let's get to introduce some more characters real quick so we can hurry up and introduce the real villains of the movie, the pigs. I didn't even know pigs were coming into this. (laughs) I didn't know they were part of the game. That was all a big surprise. Another joke I liked, these birds have never seen a boat before, and you got the woodpecker there, you know, taking a selfie with the boat, and when he takes the selfie, who's in the background? Bomb. Sorry to photobomb you. 
Mm -hmm. The problem is that's the kind of joke that if you were having a good time, you'd roll with. But if you haven't been laughing, it's not going to save it. So I, I get what you're saying. There's good little moments in here. But if you're cranky like me and confused like me, I just want to reiterate, where <laughs> is the history between birds and pigs not getting along? Like cats and dogs, I get that's a thing. Mongoose and cobra, sure, long time battle. Pigs have never fought with birds. I think that's part of the success of the game is the seemingly arbitrary nature of cute green pigs and flightless colorful birds. Mm-hmm. Okay, because it makes no sense is why it's enjoyable in a game. But when tasked with writing an origin story for a movie, suddenly you are given the horrible problem of making all of this stuff plausible and exciting and funny. Seriously, the real world answer is why it's green pigs is because the guy who designed these birds has always been drawing this funny little cute cartoon pig character his whole life, and since the main bird was red, he went with the polar opposite and made his pig green. That's as much thought was put into the game, and that's what I keep trying to reiterate here, is that this game was tossed together over the course of two weeks and became much bigger than they ever had dreamed, and now we're sitting through a Hollywood production of these characters that were crapped out in an office in Norway seven years ago. Pigs will eat eggs! Yeah, and I eat eggs with bacon. Like, this whole rivalry feels weird, and I sense that it had to be this way because the game made it as so, but I don't understand why pigs from a pig island come sailing to this island hunting for the bird eggs. But it's going to be established in deleted scenes that it's been a long-lost hope of all the kings of the pigs to get here. They've known about it for a long time, and now this Leonard, Bill Cater's character, has finally fulfilled his family destiny and arrived. That would have been nice to have, because it is seemingly arbitrary that the pigs show up from Piggy Island, where there are no birds, and I'm like... How do the pigs know of eggs? Why are they craving eggs? Are these pigs like locusts that go island to island and find? Do they go island to island just obliterating egg laying creatures and cause mass extinction? You're right. They're trying to establish not very well that these eggs are a delicacy to these pigs, which we may or may not know about eggs already, but when we see them back on their island, they have a big party and they're wanting eggs and they want omelets and all that stuff. But it makes you question, what do they eat normally? I saw pigs in the background, like, frying up hot dogs and sausages. Yes, they are cannibalistic pigs. Yeah, and they're making cakes, so they've clearly had eggs before. At any rate... Okay, so that's it. That's the game. The game is these pigs come. We know that Red is right. Red can instantly sense that these guys are not what they seem. First of all, they lie about saying there's only two of us and then more keeps showing up. I like the joke. These pigs aren't kosher. Right. And <laughs> so, yeah, there's actually going to be two boatloads of them by the end, but no one will listen to Red because Red complains about everything. And Red is ostracized from the rest of the village and everyone wants to be happy. Ergo, they only accept new information as positive news. They're not willing to conclude what's obvious as these pigs are going around taking pictures of the nursery and licking their lips. And when they're asked to say cheese for the picture, they say cheese omelets. Yeah, posted to Instaham. <laughs> this is where I'm getting my jollies is on the bad puns. Yeah, they pull out a book, Fifty Shades of Green. I mean, there's a million of these. Just keep going. And if you like that, then you will probably enjoy this. Like I said, I'm getting my fun from the background. Like on their boat, they have a ham radio. I mean, <laughs> you want my Pac-Man pun book? I think I can find that joke book somewhere. It's somewhere in the back closet. You, you'll have a field day. There's a lot of this material. <laughs> but I am wondering, these are some weird gifts for the pigs to bring the birds. Slingshots and trampolines. Could they not find a better way to integrate a slingshot into this plot other than the pigs give them the weapons that will be the pig's own downfall? Yeah, I don't understand the logic of that. Uh, I mean, it's it's introduced in this scene because we see that the pigs are very annoyed with Red. Red's house was destroyed when they dropped anchor, and he's just always interrupting their spiel. And so they slingshot him off and try to take him out of the picture and try to distract everyone with a Magic Mike country and western dance number done by Blake Shelton. Yeah, that was like the big single from the movie. I mean, how big? 
As in they released it and hoped it would make money. I mean, yeah. come on. It's better than pulling Limp Bizkit out from 10 years earlier to sing Behind Blue Eyes during a sad red montage. Again, I have to believe that some of this was just about what was available, what was cheap. But Blake Shelton would be a get, I guess. He was recently voted Sexiest Man Alive, and he's on one of those reality singing shows, and I think sells a lot of country and western music. I don't know a single one of his songs. But we are reminded at this point that animated movies, by and large, are also musicals. So they throw in some arbitrary dance numbers here. And if you want to know how to do all these steps, again, there's a woman in a pig outfit and a chicken outfit that will teach you. I actually think I might get more laughs out of that than the movie. (laughs) I did. Yeah, when Blake Shelton's song starts playing, it really hits home for me that this is starting to feel like a movie that was test marketed in a Walmart parking lot. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> it, it, anything and everything that they can try to do to pander to a certain demographic, they are going to throw up on screen here. Yeah, and even though they've got their own property, there's not enough there to pull from. So you can just feel them pulling from other things. These pigs are minions, right? Everything that they're doing, they just even kind of look. If they were yellow, they would be minions running around doing these little piggy things. Yeah, but I actually like Despicable Me, and I like minions. I mean, again, I'm not anti-animation. I thought Steve Carell did really well in the role of Gru. I wish this had a tenth of the cleverness of the minions. I mean, the pigs are cute enough, and the birds are well-defined, but they're just not doing anything interesting. I had really hoped... First, when they got to anger management class, now the movie's going to kick in. Mm. Then I hoped, oh, the pigs are here. Now the movie's going to kick in. But much like the problem with Mysterio being the bad guy in Amazing Spider-Man, this movie plays far too long before they reveal that these pigs are bad guys. Yeah, I agree. They should have stolen the eggs while they were doing this country and western number. Instead, they have to work in this whole plot about... Here's another reason why Red is angry, one of nine that we're given. And is this why he's the angry bird? I don't know. He grew up believing the town legend that they're protected by Mighty Eagle. And there are statues to this thing. There are other people that believe this too, but his schoolmates treat it like Santa Claus, make fun of him for believing in that, make fun of him for reading comic books about that. And so he is the only one to believe that Mighty Eagle can save them and he's going to convince Chuck and Bomb to come with him on this mountain climbing adventure to get the hero. Which is also a little specious for even within this movie's own world building is no bird has ever climbed up that mountain. I mean, it wasn't like it was a huge trek or anything. They didn't have to go through different climates and, you know, camp overnight. It's not Everest. (laughs) It was just, you know, it was half a day of hiking up a hill and they found out that the legend is true. But the eagle is retired or too vain or it does seem like he used to do something because he's got a lot of trophies for previous things that he's accomplished. But it has been a long time of him resting on his laurels and his legend and kind of forgetting how to fly. Yeah, he kind of plays like a a washed up rock star from the 80s. Like, you know, a guy used to be like a sex symbol, like Axl Rose. Like, and then rolling him out now, and he's, like, 50 pounds overweight and puffy, but still thinking he's oozing sex. Why not do him? That would be awesome. I mean, if they got Sean Penn, they could get Axel Rose. <laughs> no offense to Peter Dinklage. Yeah, well, Peter Dinklage has a very strange movie career since the success of Game of Thrones. I mean, pre-Game of Thrones, you found him in common roles. I mean, he was very good in them, but I remember seeing him in Nip Tuck as the little person who the doctor's wife leaves him for, and they have a little person baby together, and the doctor's all torn up about that. And in Elf, you know, he's the story writer who's really rich and has a temper. But it seems like he is, and good for him, but taking roles that always have him on screen bigger than he is. I mean, in Infinity War, he's a giant dwarf. Here, he's an eagle who stands above everybody else. Even X-Men Days of Future Past, he was a little person who controlled giant machines. There's some weird kind of through line there that makes me wonder what is driving Dinklage's choice of roles. He does have a very deep tenor voice. And he's a great actor. I really do love Peter Dinklage. I just find it a strange accumulation of roles in recent times. And that may be what's offered 
to him. I mean, it may be that many people think the irony of offering the larger than life parts to the little person is something that's, you know, it's about as funny as every other joke here. So, and listen, I'm not trying to limit his roles. This is voiceover work. Anybody can voice anything. And he does really well here. What does Mighty Eagle do in the game? Is he some kind of big boss that can really take down the pigs? Yeah, if I remember correctly, you have to earn him. And you can only use him once. And he, like, flies over and, like, maybe drops a big egg or something. Or does, a like, a swooping action that knocks down the whole level for you if you're really stuck. All right, that makes sense. So th the fact that they create him as mythic, it's, it is because you're not going to use him very often when playing the game, but he could be your savior if you are able to find him. Pretty much. That's how my memory is of him. Like, I, I don't remember being able to use him a whole bunch of times. I think it's something you had to earn by passing so many levels and maybe even cashing in some of your stars or eggs or whatever the point system was. Yeah, you could every so often get, like, kind of a cheat he was huge and he would just come through and plow down a lot of stuff it's been a while but i do remember him being a very special bird and yeah he actually flew he did not need the slingshot okay it was an opportunity to maybe where red could learn to fly or like that's what they could actually again all these birds have wings they could actually do that but they're building up to a climax where birds are going to jump on trampolines and fly through the air via slingshots and do what you do in the game so i need to get over this whole issue about birds that can't fly exactly i mean if you're making a movie based on this game you need to adhere to those rules the birds need to use a slingshot through and through yes but pity the person that has to make a movie out of this because i'm just not seeing enough here that's very exciting meanwhile the eggs are being taken. Finally, we get a, through the guise of a Daft Pig concert, the, <laughs> Arnie, really? I'm mad at you. Stop it. You're not allowed to laugh at that. Anyway, they're raving it up. All the birds do not understand. They've gotten bird sitters. Ha ha. They're dancing away and do not know that there's a giant hoist of eggs being taken away and only Red and Bomb and Chuck are able to fend it off because Eagle has disappointed them. Or kind of played some kind of sage role where he's teaching them how to be self-sufficient. He's like, you pass the first lesson, and when they leave him, when they get frustrated that he's not coming with them, he kind of turns to the camera and, and winks as if to say that this is all part of his plan to make Red, Chuck, and Bomb the heroes of their own. At any rate, they're not very heroic because they're not able to stop the eggs from being taken, but... People are now willing to listen to Red. He was the only one that could see what the pigs were really about. And they're willing to do what anything that he can come up with. And his plan is, let's sail to Piggy Island. We'll put together boxes of TNT and slingshots and make a sailboat and get to the climax of the film. Yeah, and I was actually hoping they might go biblical. Like, is this King Mudbeard going to be like King Herod in the Bible who kills all the babies is it gonna be like the pied piper no they're just gonna treat it like food and there's not really going to be any well fetuses are in peril they're not going to play that up in this movie no maybe for the best i mean i don't need to think about <laughs> i mean again we already saw the main character smash into an egg and the baby lived we know that yes they're about to all be dumped into a big boiling cauldron there is a chef pig that can't wait to cook all of the eggs, and the king has declared dinner lunch once he sees all the birds have sailed over, and he is going to try and eat them as fast as he can. And a lot of these pig outfits are straight from the game. There are pigs that have, like, infantry helmets that are harder to kill, and there are pigs that have little chef hats just because it's cute, and there are there's a king pig. There is a pig with a crown. And I figure that's true of these birds, too, because I'm seeing people that I, they might have been in the background, but suddenly there's a toucan that's boomeranging and one that goes over sneezing bubbles inflates when it lands. Stella <laughs> is this pink thing. I don't know what these birds are, but they must mean something to players of the game. And even up to this point, you know, we're getting to the climax and this is where it becomes apparent that in better hands, Pixar or even DreamWorks animation might have given us a little bit of a twist here, you know, like if the whole thing of the pigs is that they're trying to steal the eggs, 
Maybe we find out that the king has talked his subjects into, yes, let's get the eggs and you can eat them. We can have a feast. But maybe there's something magic with the shells that he's doing something nefarious with, like trying to take over the entire world because of the magic of the shells or something. None of that. It's just they want to eat the eggs. And that's the whole kit and caboodle there. And again, like you said, we've seen them eating hot dogs and such. Maybe if they could play this up as like, this is the salvation of our species so we don't have to eat each other or something. Yes, why they can't be happy living as they have for all of this time is one of the hundreds, maybe millions of questions that I will never get an answer to as we hurtle through a climax that is about slinging birds through buildings and Red Bomb and Chuck are proving to be the heroes that Eagle wasn't going to be by bursting into this lunch and doing their best to rescue the eggs. Although the eagle does end up taking the eggs. I mean, So there is a little bit of a moral here that can be tied to the game. If in the game, all you're trying to do is get to that eagle to get the easy way out, then that can kind of be seen as a cheat or a shortcut. And if this movie has one message, even if it's just kind of like slid in there, is, hey, trust in yourself, be true to yourself, be who you are, and you can be your own hero. Yeah, I also wonder if there is something about anger. I mean, the birds are now with Red. They are angry. They're not happy birds anymore, but they don't want to leave the message of get in touch with your inner rage. That doesn't <laughs> seem to be a, a lesson you'd want to teach children or adults, really. Yeah, you get a pretty decent recreation of the game here. You never go against a level this intricate because you'd never have enough birds to finish it. I mean, their buildings are... Huff puff and blow them down pig buildings, not these intricate brick castles by and large. But yeah, there's dynamite all over that you sometimes have to hit in order to blow up the structures and pop the pigs. So yeah, I feel like this is a decent end. I do wonder, was the judge played by Key... Was he the leader of this bird society? I mean, there's no bird army. They just, they all turn to red in this moment of crisis because he's the only one who had suspicions of the pig. But it's not like he is the most angry. He actually has the least to lose. He's childless. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think that they've studied martial arts or in war or there's probably nothing that they've done to deal with their aggressions. They probably had no aggressions. So yeah, who better than the people from anger management? And Matilda's got some rage too. Like she's got eggs that fire out of her backside that are like fireballs or something. There is a bird that you can launch. And what it does is not only does it hit, but it actually will drop an egg. So it's a double hit. The egg hits one thing and then the bird itself hits something else. Yeah, they're not neon flashes of plasma balls like this. They're just eggs. But yeah, that's one of the things in the game. Like, yeah, this ending is doing a pretty decent job of making this 2D side scroller game look really cool in a 3D world. And they do bring in some elements. You're right, Arnie. In the game, we're not knocking down big stone castles and stuff, but there's a few places in here where there's like a box of glass in between other things. It's like, oh, that's very much from the game. You use one of your birds to break that part and then the top part falls down and creates a cavalcade of chaos behind it. Same thing with like the tall towers, you know, when you see the towers topple from a wide angle, I definitely felt that was the game. I was upset that Terrence never gets to fly. I mean, there is a giant red bird that just is like a boulder in the game and you can fire him. But here he breaks the slingshot and no more birds can fire. Yeah, he gets a tank. Yeah, surprisingly, we did see the little bird from the game that was kind of a late addition when the game had was popular that you fire, and then once it hits the ground, you tap it again, and he blows up into a big balloon and takes out a whole bunch of space. We got to see him in the background doing a little bit of damage. I do have to ask, while they're running through the castle, though, Red and Chuck are running through, and for no reason I can understand, I actually had to rewind and watch it again, Red comes across the twins from The Shining. Yeah. yeah. And they even say Red Rum. What? Yeah. <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything I can put together. It has as much to do with anything as the eagle dancing to Tone Loke's wild thing. I mean, <laughs> references. <laughs> Let's just do things people know. I mean, like they'll do a whole scene of Gone with the Wind or something. You know, name something and we'll do a charades is what I feel like. Like anything goes. And you're right. The difference between clever and random is the ability for screenwriters to find logical reasons to introduce references. 
Without them, they just become empty and, in my opinion, stupid. Look at The Simpsons. There's somebody that really knows how to utilize a reference every time. They can draw from really obscure sources at the right moment and just have us on our feet. Yeah, these people just know what good movies are and, and desperately wish you mistake this for one of them. I just think about how we talked about in the Toy Story series, how the Pixar guys put subtle references to The Shining in those movies, like the carpet pattern and things. And here, it felt like, look, we're Pixar. Here's The Shining. Yeah. They know what an animated movie should look like. They know the kinds of jokes that get told, this energy, the movement, the design. They've studied it. But they don't have the property to enchant. I mean, I care nothing about Red saving this last egg that's filled with three little bluebirds. I don't know if that's from the game or not. But they make a big deal about how he goes back and nearly sacrifices his life for this one last egg. Where you think, because King Mudbeard calls Red eyebrows and we know that's a trigger for him that he's going to blow his gasket here but he has figured out through it sounds like in the same way that the machinations of the game works a bunch of things are happening like a rube goldberg he knows that cauldron is going to fall on him and the egg and protect them when all of these dynamite sticks explode and thus he by keeping cool will be saved and he is rewarded for it the climax of the movie is them rebuilding his house inside the village and he has friends and everything's happy and he won't be an angry bird anymore presumably but they're gonna fake you out first he's like yeah well i get to see you guys but i don't have the ocean view pluses and minuses and he goes off to be alone and bomb and chuck are both like oh we thought we developed a friendship and then it's gonna end with them all i guess becoming roommates sure why not i guess we'll find out in this exciting sequel i can't wait to experience <laughs> <laughs> well, let's knock this one down first. Justin Stewart, did Angry Birds take flight? Justin. Have you ever seen those memes that come across Facebook where it's like, I taught a computer to watch 48 hours of horror movies, and then I asked it to write a horror movie, right? And then, like, you see the script, and it's like, teenagers in the woods, old man is angry, and it's funny because it's computer talk, and it only kind of understands human stuff. <laughs> I kind of feel like somebody did that with Angry Birds. Somebody taught a computer to play Angry Birds for six years and then write a script because all the pieces are in place here. We've talked about how good looking the animation is, which is not an easy thing. It's impressive to get good animation out of something like this. The character designs are great. And I feel like if I'm a huge fan of the game, I feel like they all look like really cool 3D versions of the characters I love on my flat 2D screen. And then we have this cast. Whereas an adult, I can look at this cast and be like, oh, wow, yeah, I like Sudeikis, I like Josh Gad, Danny McBride's funny, Maya Rudolph, Bill Hader, Peter Dinklage, yes, I could be in for this. But when you sit down and watch it, none of it gels. None of it comes together. The good-looking animation doesn't gel with the writing. It doesn't feel like we mentioned earlier, it doesn't feel like any of these people were in the same room making this movie. And I think that goes for the writers, too. I think somebody wrote a first draft, handed it off to somebody else, and they wrote some notes on it. Somebody else took it, and before you knew it, somebody's like, oh, we're shooting today. Let's just go with this last final version we have. So I felt like before we sat down to do this, I had made up my mind about this movie. But I wanted to come in fresh, you know, because I did enjoy the game for many years. I played it as probably as long as Arnie, if not a little bit longer. Like, I wasn't as offended by the Star Wars merger that they did. But, you know, it eventually just kind of faded away, as all games do. But I kind of had fun coming back and getting into this property. I played the game a little bit over the last week, remembering some of the characters and what they could do, their special powers. Came in to watch this movie, and it was exactly what I thought it was. It just it felt like a movie where they were just looking for marketing ploys to pop in here and there. And somebody said, oh, we got to make it funny like a Pixar movie so adults can enjoy it too. So they went back in and put, like you said, Fifty Shades of Green jokes and bird orgy things in there. There's even a bit swapping joke at one point where they found out that like they were drinking the eagle's pee water. <laughs> like It's not just adult humor. It's like crass, gross adult humor in some places where it's like, whoa, what are you guys doing here? That's why it's PG. Yeah, rude humor <laughs> is how that is categorized by the MPAA. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I just, I could not find any joy in it. I know there's not a lot of source material for them to pull from, but you have to do more than just make it look like the source material. And they, it feels like that's the part they forgot. 
there's nothing here to grab onto. There's nothing here for me to be like, oh, I can't wait for a continuation of this story. And it shocks me outside of the fact that, the, you know, they had a big box office three years ago that there is a sequel to this and most everybody's coming back for it. So, yeah, I'm disappointed in this and maybe I'm fingers crossed that the second one isn't just a money grab for a property that feels long dead, but I'm not going to hold my breath. This one's a kind of a disappointing red arrow for me. Stuart. Yeah, some video games have mystery. They have cinematic possibilities and some don't. And the reason why I was such an angry bird during this podcast is like there's nothing about this property that feels like it has something to tell us in a movie. It doesn't need to be a movie. There are plenty of great video games that got no movie. We didn't ever ask, why is Pac-Man hungry? What planet do the space invaders come from? Who built the wall in Breakout and what's on the other side? <laughs> Not questions <laughs> I ever wanted to know. And I liked all those games. But then I thought about it and I realized it hit me like Terrence shot from a slingshot. At the right age, you do want those answers. I wanted those answers. I have already gone on record and talked about during my elementary school years, I was allowed to go off and write plays and stage productions with my classmates based on whatever I could think of. And guess what I wrote about? Hubert. I had him jumping around on stacks of chairs, you know, like mass market properties that had captured the public's imagination without establishing a proper origin story is a source of mystery to the very young. We want to know more about Angry Birds if they're just these unknown, almost nameless characters that you know on a phone. So for the fourth graders in the audience, are they going to like it? Yes. Does that mean I'm giving this a green arrow? No. It means that you as a parent have a responsibility to teach them better. There are better kids movies out there. Let them play the game. Let them spend time on their phone playing the game. Don't cave and let them see this movie. It's just not quality. It is not good children's entertainment. And I've seen a lot at this point. You know, we've covered it and we know what's good. And this ain't it. This is a bunch of random stuff that barely coheres. Sure, it's got a catchy song. Sure, it's got a few elements. Again, fourth graders are going to love it. Don't let them. Don't let them near this thing. It is as red an arrow as the bird. And I've played Happy Bird here just because I felt like your anger management needed a little bit of balancing. But don't mistake that for me liking this movie one iota, please. Good. Oh, <laughs> thank you so I'm like, you're, you're really going to have some explaining to do if you go green on this. I mean, I was clinging with fingernails to what few things I could find amusing in this. But just looking at this as a movie, take away any age range or anything else, just looking at it as a movie... It has got poor character development, poor character motivation, poor plotting. I mean, it is just severely badly written, which is a shame because the technical side, the programmers, the animators knocked it out of the park. But the people who put words in the bird's mouth failed utterly. And I was so hopeful with this cast and with the look of the film that this might be another Shrek or another Despicable Me or something. I mean, you could have definitely gone Despicable Me with yeah. an Angry Bird. Yeah, they, you can make a good Angry Birds movie. I do believe that, even though I don't think that there's anything here, but you have to create it. You have to start from the ground up, take the bits from the game and create it, and you got to get better writers if they had. I mean, think about it, though. That happens all the time. I met the guy who created the story of Masters of the Universe when all he was shown was a bunch of toys and said figure out a way to make these things interact in which are good guys and which are bad guys. I mean, there's all the times, toy line, video game, what have you, writers are tasked with creating a universe out of a marketing idea, and we've seen it done well, and we've seen it done poorly. I would say this is as poorly done as the Masters of the Universe Stolf Lundgren movie. Yeah. <laughs> or many movies in this retrospective. Let's be clear, many times the writers do not find the movie in the video game. What I kept thinking about was Detective Pikachu and how that took the rules of the Pokemon world and gave us an interesting story that fit in the rules but wasn't limited by those rules. It was able to expand a bit beyond. And here, this was the exact opposite. This is what I kind of feared Detective Pikachu would be. Yeah. I came into this thinking, 
that I might discover an animated gem, and instead this movie laid an egg. It's a Redbird Arrow, and I'm now dreading three weeks from now, whereas I had gone in kind of hopeful. I'm not as bad as you. I'm going to use my Stubbs A-list premium and actually get an Angry Birds ticket for a very late showing. <laughs> <That's-> <laughs> <laughs> you should see it in 3D. You were talking so much about that. There is going to be some 3D showings, although I think most of them will be in 2D. If the time is possible, and sometimes it's really hard, there's like, it's one 3D showing at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. It's But hey, if this goes IMAX or if this goes 3D, sure, I will. IMAX. There's got to be another movie out in IMAX. I, I, again, I've sensed, like you guys, the moment has passed. They know it. They probably should just release this straight to home viewing platforms and bypass theaters. This seems like they are building a giant bomb. But what do I know? It could be a late August treat for kids right about to go back to school. As a parent who's had kids grow up at different times, there are certain videos that kids latch on to and you're fine with letting them sit down in front of the TV and watch it over and over and over again. And this was like one of those movies that I, if like we had sat down to watch it and one of my kids was into it, I probably would have walked through the room once or twice while they were watching it and caught a piece here and there and been like, oh, that's not too terrible. I get the feeling a lot of parents have had that experience with this movie. They haven't seen the whole thing and don't know just how bad it is. And that might be driving the success of it. There's going to be a ton of parents that have this first one, have kids that they know love it, haven't really seen it, and they're going to go to the movie theaters in a couple weeks and give money to this franchise once again, encouraging them to continue with this half-assed effort with a property that was half-assed over a weekend that has just failed upwards for over a decade now. To your point, Justin, the music in this is primarily Gen X music that... If the parents were walking through, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that song. I like I Will Survive. Yeah, I like The Shining. Again, they throw the bits at you, the eye candy to hook you. But if you actually submit to it, it's not enjoyable. And I just want to point out three years have passed for kids entertainment. That's an eternity. That means that the audience that loved it back in 2016 would dare be seen going to the sequel. They waited too late on this thing, and they're going to have to hook a new generation. I think that was a problem in 2016, too, because the audience that would have grown up with the game had already aged out by the time they got a movie out for them. Hell, I had aged out by the time they got the movie out for them. (laughs) I went from 40 to 45 over that time. So we get a little bit of breather. I got to admit, I'm glad that we're not doing it this weekend. We're doing this movie early because we have a couple other films coming out. Hobbs and Shaw, the spinoff of Fast and Furious. All right. You've been kind of dreading it. Jacob and I are both really excited about this. And every trailer I see gets me more excited. But Stuart, which are you dreading more now? Hobbs and Shaw or Angry Birds 2? You know what? Angry Birds 2 is the movie I least want to see that was on our schedule the entire year. There's, (laughs) There's no way I could be less excited about Angry Birds 2. Hobbs and Shaw, I like the actors. I don't like this style of action movie, and that's just the problem. It seems really over the top, really high octane. I'm going to try. I I, I always do. I'm not dreading it, but I'm not optimistic that this is going to be my favorite film of the summer. And Arnie, let me ask you, which are you dreading more, Angry Birds 2 or a movie with Melissa McCarthy? Because that's what we got after Hobbs and Shaw. Believe it or not, The Kitchen, a 70s, what looks like a Scorsese wannabe with chicks, is actually a DC comic book. And so thus, it's part of our DC team's retrospective. I would normally say I would be afraid of the Melissa McCarthy film most of all. I dread going to that. But God help me, that trailer looks good. And maybe Melissa McCarthy can do dramatic, and I just can't stand her When she's in funny mode, because I can't stand her in funny mode. I predict she can do dramatic. I predict she cannot do an Irish accent properly. (laughs) Is she trying? I think so. Well, it's in Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, I think someone's (laughs) going to try for it. It probably won't be Tiffany Haddish. Anyway, it should be interesting. I'm not sure whether it'll be good or bad, but it's at least more my kind of movie. Well, out of all the movies we're doing, we're doing four theatrical releases in four weeks, We talked about the three that are going to be on the main feed, but the movie I'm most excited for is actually coming out for donors this Friday, Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I don't read reviews before I see it, but unfortunately, Facebook headlines are inescapable. Tarantino's best? 
I find it hard to believe, but hey, if it's one of Tarantino's top five, I'll be really excited. Yeah, Tarantino's always worth discussing. I mean, there's very few of his films. There's none of his films that I, I think you shouldn't see. There's very few of his films that I don't really enjoy or want to talk about. And this one, yeah, I think that there's from what they're doing with Sharon Tate and this is being a, a commentary on Tarantino and Hollywood at a pivotal moment. I can't wait to dig into this film. I, I'm already planning on seeing it twice and we're going to have that epic review out this Friday for people that donated for the Tarantino series that we did just a few years ago when Hateful Eight came out. Or if you donated at the big kahuna level this time, more friends till the end, you'll get that. And if you haven't donated for Tarantino in the past, it supports our show. It helps us keep doing all the shows we do every week and mostly twice a week. If you're a donor or a patron, we've been doing two shows a week for most of the year. We love doing it. We love that you guys want to hear us talk these movies and two times a week isn't too much for you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. And I do hope you can join us for the Tarantino shows. And then after that, we're going to finish off the summer of 1989. It is funny how I'm reading so many articles right now that do just refer to the summer of 1989 as one of the best and biggest in history. I read a oral retrospective on UHF just this morning where they talked about what a gangbusters 1989 summer was and how UHF didn't stand a chance. UHF. Yeah, we didn't include that one. The ones that are left are When Harry Met Sally, Parenthood, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and James Cameron's The Abyss. You can see all the schedule at our website in the right-hand column, nowplayingpodcast.com. But it's time for us to fly. Justin Stewart, thank you for joining me. Till next time, bird to your mother. Oh, Crimson Woody Ash. Who? You learned your lessons well. You're my prized pupils. Your prized what? Oh, don't you see? I had to make you lose faith in me so you could learn to have faith in yourself. That's really not how it felt. Thank you for listening to this episode of Now Playing Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Think about it. That was beautiful. You're going to make me cry. Yeah, that was some real... (laughs) clever symbolism come back to nowplayingpodcast.com each week for another new movie review podcast there's more (laughs) i'm going back in also at our site you can find hundreds of other movie reviews including star wars a nightmare on elm street independence day the avengers films back to the future batman superman the fast and the furious and more oh so many good movies which one should i pick Now Playing Podcast is a show without any sponsors or ads. We rely on support from listeners like you to keep Now Playing operating. (laughs) Working with what we got. You can donate to the show and, as our thank you, receive bonus podcasts. Over 150 bonus movie reviews are available to choose from on the Now Playing Podbean page, including Alien, Night of the Living Dead, Jurassic Park, Ghostbusters, Indiana Jones, Lord of the Rings, Psycho, Troll, and more. One of each, please. Find a full list of available bonus shows at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash donate. Come on, give him a hand. You can also join the Now Playing patron campaign through our Podbean site. Patrons of $10 or more get a new exclusive movie review every month. Plus, even more perks, including one where you can pick a movie for our host to review. Find the details on our website. And if I'm being honest, well, I mean, you know, I could kind of use your help. What's that? What are you trying to say? Uh, Nothing. I was just saying that I I could use your help. You can follow Now Playing on Facebook and Twitter, where we post announcements of new episodes and where the hosts post movie mini reviews. Links to our social media pages are available on our homepage. Did you just do like a little pop-in? Now Playing Podcast is produced and edited by Arnie Carvalho. So he's kind of a wackadoodle. You know, that doesn't mean he's not wise. Associate produced by Jason Latham. I have to get a team together. Now Playing Credits, read by Brock. Just say what you gotta say and then get out. The opinions expressed on Now Playing are those of the individual hosts 
and may not reflect the opinion of Venganza Media Incorporated. Give me one good reason why I should believe you. Venganza Media Incorporated is not affiliated with the motion pictures reviewed or otherwise referred to herein. All movie clips and music included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review and no infringement is intended. Well, that's disappointing. Now Playing Podcast is an exclusive trademark of Venganza Media Incorporated and may not be used without the expressed written permission of Venganza Media Incorporated. All rights reserved. I just don't think this is going to work. Now Playing is a Venganza Media production, copyright 2018, and no part of this show may be reproduced, repurposed, or redistributed without the written permission of Venganza Media Incorporated. I guess birds and pigs will always be enemies. Test, test. Yep, yep. Bird to your mother. That is my end line for the show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, referencing Vanilla Ice is there. I mean, they do tone Loke at one point in this movie. Vanilla Ice is in the uh, trailer for part two. Oh, you're kidding. No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and it's not ninja rap. <laughs> <laughs> Red has a fantasy about Mighty Equal. Mighty, mighty Equal. Ah! Do they go island to island just obliterating Oviparous animals? What did you just say? <laughs> Oviparous. <laughs> say that again, Mr. Wizard. Oviparous. <laughs> Oviparous? I don't know where they go in Europe. <laughs> Oviparous. P-A-R-O-U-S. Overpowers? Okay. No, Paris. I, uh, you know what? You can keep that in the show if you think it sounds smart. <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> There's like one dude that knows science right now that plays this game that's listening to be like, oh, God, <laughs> these guys are idiots. <laughs> Red and Charlie. Chuck. Red and Chuck. <laughs> I prefer to call him by his given right, Call him whatever you want. Right? It's fine. <laughs>